We're privileged to have as our guest tonight, Sue Thomas. Sue is a highly in demand international speaker, speaking all over the nation, other parts of the world. She has a special gift of communication and her story will bless you tonight. It will also challenge you to be all that you can be to make your corner of the world just a little brighter and a little better. We're delighted here at Family Worship Center to present to you one of God's choice servants tonight. Please welcome Sue Thomas, FBI. What a joy and a privilege it is to be with you this evening. It's been a remarkable day as we have paused to honor mothers throughout our country. It's a very special time for me as I stand before you tonight to share this story because for once and for all, there's an appropriate time where I can dedicate this to my mother. She's 90 years of age. And basically, there wouldn't be a story without the love and the sacrifice and the time that she so devoted to me. So tonight, Mom, this is for you. Now, I come tonight basically not as a preacher because the more that I study the Word of God, the more that I realize I don't know the Word of God. And basically, I don't come tonight as a teacher either, because I do have three older brothers that can testify to the fact that their little sister does some pretty dumb things at times. But if there would be one title that I would carry forth through life and feel most comfortable with, it would be that as a witness. I have been profoundly deaf since the age of 18 months and during the course of my journeys of my travel, I have used my eyes to behold the majestic beauty of his splendor. I have used my eyes to see the miraculous deeds that the great Lord has done, not only in my life, but in the lives of his people everywhere. So I feel very comfortable to claim that title as a witness. Tonight, the story that you're about to hear is true. The names have not been changed to protect the innocent. <laughs> Why? We're all guilty of something at one time or another. But I've always told the story for two reasons, and two reasons only. First and foremost, for the glory of God. And secondly, for the hope of his people. This is the story. At the age of 18 months, I'm a typical normal hearing child. It's early evening and I'm watching TV with my three older brothers. On a given moment, I run up to that television and I turn up the knob full blast. That really gets my brother's attention. They run up to the television and turn the knob down. I turn it up, they turn it down. I turn it up, well, let's face it. It didn't take mom and dad long to run in to find out what all the racket was about. They took one look at me and they thought that I was getting tired and cranky and that it was time to put me to bed. That night when my parents tucked me into bed, neither of them realized that it would be the very first long silent night of the rest of my life. It wasn't until the next morning as my mom was talking, sounds were going off, she realized I was totally oblivious to my surroundings. She grew concerned and called our neighbor who was a nurse. After a lot of discussion on the phone, I was placed in the car and rushed to the hospital. There the doctors examined me and turned to my mother and said those words that would follow her the rest of her life. There's no hearing there. She's profoundly deaf. And from that moment on, doctors and educators alike began to share with my parents it would be best to put me in a deaf institution, that I'd never be able to learn to speak, 
and I would simply have a hard time learning anything. I was their only daughter. I was their youngest. They didn't want to send me away. And with that, they took a silent vow to do everything possible that would enable me to live and to survive in that world of sound. Well, one of the first tools came in form of another car ride. Only this time when the car stopped, I got out and I stood on the curb and I looked up and I saw this gray monstrous castle. At least that's what it looked like to the little kid that day. And before I knew it, we were entering and I saw the high cathedral ceiling, the big stone fireplace, and I thought I was in some sort of a dungeon. But what really got my attention was the very back of the room. Two very large doors opened very slowly that day, and out walked this little old lady. And as she came walking towards me, I looked at her and I thought to myself, boy, does she look awful old. But my next thought was, boy, does she look awful mean. And she came up to me that day and she extended her hand to shake my hand. And I made the mistake of shaking her hand. Why was it a mistake? She didn't let go. And with that, she began to pull me back into the same room that she came out of. And that day, I entered a room unlike all others. It was a room filled with nothing but mirrors. Huge mirrors hung on the walls, big mirrors on stands, small and medium-sized mirrors all over the table. She took two chairs and she placed them in front of a large mirror. She sat me in one and sat right next to me. And there we looked at each other in the mirror for an awful long time. <laughs> all of a sudden, she started to play that stupid silent mouth game that I had grown to hate. It's a game that my brothers were playing, my parents, friends, everyone. It's a game where everybody opened their mouth, but no sound came out. But somehow they all knew the rules how to play this game. Because everybody knew what the other person was doing, everybody except for me. I was constantly left out, constantly in a state of confusion. And now here was this little old lady playing that same game. But that day she did something very different. As she began to move her mouth, she reached down and she took my hand in hers and she laid it very lightly on her throat. And as she began to move her mouth, I felt vibrations on that throat and it really got my attention. The only problem is she would stop moving her mouth in order to reach down to pick up a ball or an apple. And I'd be sitting on the edge of my seat waiting so desperately for her to move her mouth. And as soon as she did so, I lunged for her neck and I held on for dear life. I didn't realize that when you strangle someone, you kill all the vibrations down there. There's absolutely nothing to feel. Oh, sure. Maybe a little air kiss hissing out the side of the mouth, you know. And she'd be trying to wrestle with my hands, trying to get it off of her throat. And then sort of flop it up and down like rabbit ears to get it loose from light. And back on the throat, I could feel those vibes. But I was right about this little old lady. She was off of me. Why? No matter how hard I tried to do what she wanted me to do, it was never good enough. All I ever saw on her face was a frown. Her head shaking, no, you didn't do it right, do it again. No, that's not right, do it again. Over and over, and if I ever thought that that first half hour session was my first and last, boy, was I wrong. She would be with me for the next seven years of my life. But I have a confession to make. I thank God for that mean little old lady. Without her life, her dedication, her persistency, I wouldn't have the voice to speak. And as my father has always said, it took her so long to learn the talk. Now we can't get her to shut up. <laughs> and he's right. I do an awful lot of speaking, an awful lot of traveling. And for just about every person I've ever met, there's always been a question or two about my deafness, some that are more popular than others. But I think one of the most popular questions is, as a little kid, being deaf, hey, Thomas, did you think of yourself any differently than hearing kids? No. 
I mean, I thought I was just like everybody else. I liked to play the same type of game tearing kids played. One of my favorite was hide and go see. And I can remember running way out. And once I got out there, I was sort of kind of crouched down behind the shed, the shrubbery, holding my breath, being perfectly still so no one would find me. And there I would wait. And I keep waiting and waiting. 45 minutes, an hour later, I'm still out there waiting. And I got tired of waiting, and I would come back to where the game had started, only to find that all the kids had long gone home or were off playing another game. It wasn't until years later that I realized that at some particular point in the middle of that game of hide and go sink, some kid about them. Ollie, Ollie, in free! And everybody comes running home. But because I never heard them, I just stayed out there and I waited my life away. Aside from that, I don't think it's myself is any different, at least not until I went to school. And that was the one thing that I wanted to do more than anything else, was to get on that yellow school bus and go to school with my three older brothers. That day finally arrived, and it was the happiest, proudest moment of my life. And I got to school that day, and the teacher knew that I was deaf, and she put me right in the front row so I'd be able to read her lips as best as I could. And back then, I didn't read lips too good at all. But nevertheless, I saw my teacher instruct to the class that each one of us was to stand beside our deaf and introduce ourselves to our classmates. And it became my turn that day. And I got up and I stood beside my desk. And very proudly, I looked down at my classmate and said something like, ah! Ah! <laughs> And with that, the entire class erupted in laughter. Those guys were laughing so hard that day. I had to turn around to try to figure why everybody was laughing. And when I couldn't figure it out, well, I just sat down. But I came to realize that every time I was to open my mouth to speak, the entire class would erupt in laughter. And it got to the point where I wouldn't open my mouth. But that didn't matter. For you see, from the very first day, I had five boys in my class, not just one of them, but five guys. And these five guys were ordained to make my life as miserable as possible. And they didn't wait for me to speak because they knew that I wouldn't. Rather, they waited for me by the drinking fountain in the hallway, out in the playground, to push me, to poke me, to make my life miserable. But what these five guys didn't realize is I had three older brothers at home, and on Saturday night, we had to get into some good tumbling matches. And when they least suspected it in the middle of the playground, I did the only thing that I could possibly do. I punched them out. <laughs> and then I was sent to the principal's office. Oh, I remember my school days very well. I remember sitting in that front row watching my teacher ask all sorts of questions like, what's the state capital to Ohio? And there I sat waiting for the answer, only to see my teacher break out into a big smile and shake her head and say, very good, what's the state capital of Pennsylvania? And inside I'm sitting there thinking, wait a minute, lady, first things first. What's the state capital to Ohio? I never realized that some smart kid behind me had raised his hand and gave the answer. As a result, I went through all of my school days getting just about every question that was ever asked. I just never got the answer. And my grades began to show that I wasn't getting the answer. They became D's and F. And one day, my teacher came up to me at my desk, and she looked awful sad that day. And she reached down and she took my hand in hers, and she led me out of the classroom. And that day, we walked down the hallway, and it seemed like it was an awful long walk. And that was the day I entered another classroom. 
I entered what was known as the dumbing class. And now these five guys had more ammunition to work with. I just didn't talk funny. I was now the dummy. And what was once my happiest moment of going to school, I grew to hate them. Looking back on my childhood, I've often wondered if it wasn't for those three important elements that took place in my life as a kid, if I might not have totally wiped out in that world of silence. But there was three. First and foremost, my parents instilled in me that there was a God, a supreme being, and that I was created in his image. And that as long as I believed in his son, Christ Jesus, and kept my hand in his and allowed him to lead me and guide me through life, there wouldn't be anything that I couldn't do or anything that I couldn't become. Second, I had a song. Did you get that? I had a song. No. I don't have any recollection of music. But I have a mother that loves music, and she wanted to pass that love onto her only daughter, whether she could hear it or not. And as a little kid, she used to place me on her lap as she sat in the rocking chair, rocking back and forth, singing all of her favorite songs. And with my head on her shoulder, as she sang, I could feel the vibrations. And if I really liked the song particularly well, my hand was for to creep up and lay gently on her throat that I could get all the vibes that I possibly could. It must have been around Christmas time because one of the first songs that my mom ever taught me was Silent Night. And I loved that song. No. As a little kid, I didn't have any understanding of the words. The words didn't mean anything to me. Rather, it was the rhythm and the flow of that song that brought forth tremendous peace. And I can remember going to the principal's office, getting that spanking. I would turn and walk back to my classroom, sit at my desk, bite the lower part of my limb, and look out the window. So I wouldn't start crying. And way down deep inside, I'd be singing silent night to myself. I'd be okay. Or after a long, lousy day of school, I'd be going home in the school bus, sitting so close to that window that when I looked out, my nose would be all squished up against the glass so nobody would see the tears coming down my face. And way down deep inside, I'd be singing Silent Night to myself, and I'd find that peace. Well, the third element, it came in form of a skating rink. And one day, my father took me to the rink to pick up my brothers who were skating. And before we left, Dad signed me up for skating lessons. With those lessons, I started to skate forwards, then skate backwards then do jumps, and then spin. And somebody came up with the bright idea, hey, this kid's really good, you need to put her in competition. But that's when they realized they had a problem. If you ever watched the Olympic skater skate on TV, you realize that when the skaters skate, they skate to music. Every jump has to be landed on the beam. Every spin has to be stopped on the beam. And if for nothing else, when the music is over, the routine better be over too. You know what I mean? Music. I didn't even know they were playing it, let alone skate to it. And with that, my coach took it upon himself to skate hand in hand with me at the correct beat of that music over and over till I had it down perfect. And on that given day, I skated out all by myself. And as I stood in the middle of the ring, I looked across, and there was my coach standing perfectly still and straight. And all of a sudden, he'd be jumping up and down, waving his hands, and that was the single to take off the music's on. I want to make a long story very, very short. 
At the ripe old age of seven, I became the youngest Ohio State champion freestyle skater in skating history, and it saved my life big time. Why? <laughs> Why did it save my life? Well, I might have talked off for fun. And maybe to those kids, I was the dummy. But there wasn't one kid in my school, not one of them. They had a bigger trophy than I did. <laughs> and there wasn't one kid that could do the jumps or the spins like I could. And it gave me the self-worth that I needed to hang on to. But aside from collecting all of these trophies, aside from being a champion, there was something that I wanted far greater in life. I wanted a friend. I mean, let's face it. Who wants to be a friend to a dummy? Who wants to be a friend to somebody that talks off of funny? And by the time I met up with those friends in high school, they were the wrong crowd. Those years would be one of tremendous disrespect and outright rebellion. It wouldn't be until my junior year in high school that my life would start taking a different course in a different direction. And this happened by me meeting up with my second meanest little old lady in my life. She was my typing teacher. And what I didn't realize is the day that she became a typing teacher, she had made a silent vow to herself that every student that walked across her threshold, she was going to make them the fastest typist in the history of the typewriter. And just because I was deaf, I wasn't about to be excluded. She began to work with me, slave over me, pounded in me. I was already typing 128 words a minute, and my speech kept going faster and faster. She knew something only a teacher knew. No dummy can be typing this fast. So she came to me one day and she said, you have one more year and you're out of here. What do you want to do? And for me, that was a pretty embarrassing question that day. Basically, I finally blurted out, well, I want to go to college. That day, that little old lady just about fell off her typewriter. <laughs> I mean, she knew my grades were D's and F's, the stuff for typing straight A's. She knew that these five guys were still making my life miserable. She knew how I hated school. So she just couldn't believe it when she heard me say, well, I just want to keep going to school. So she had to ask that question, why? Why do you want to go to college? And for me at that time, it was the most embarrassing question of my life. I couldn't even look at her that day basically stared down at the floor and finally said, well, because I just want to be like everybody else. She believed in me. And she began to work with me one-on-one. -on -one. And through her life, I went to college. I just didn't realize that it would take me eight years to leave the place once I got there. <laughs> eight long years passed, and I walked across that platform, and I received my college degree, and I thought to myself, okay, Thomas, the world can't wait to hire you. You're a college graduate. Boy, was I wrong. The world could wait forever. I mean, there wasn't one person not one person that was willing to give me a job. Why? I couldn't use the telephone. I mean, why hire a Thomas if somebody's out the lunch, somebody's on coffee, break the phone when she can't answer? And I never got the job. And with that, I went back to the same hearing and speech center that taught me to speak, pounded on their doors asking for a job. I know they felt sorry for me.
Why? They hired me, even when they didn't have a job. I became like a gopher, a jack of all trades, doing whatever they wanted me to do. And I can remember some days taking paper clips out of one box, sticking those paper clips in another box, and then putting them in the closet. But I was only there for a few short months when God had different ideas for my life. You see, it was a friend at that hearing and speech center who in turn had a friend that lived in Washington, D.C., who in turn had a friend that worked for the Department of State, who in turn had a friend that worked for the FBI. Now you're following this, this is really important. <laughs> Through a friend of a friend of a friend of a friend, from Washington, D.C. to Youngstown, Ohio, I get word that the FBI is looking for deaf people. And if you don't think to my, that I panicked, I thought to myself, what did we do? <laughs> it took them a long time to call me down that day, and they basically said Thomas shouldn't do anything. They just want to know if you want a job. Do I want a job? I mean, somebody was finally going to hire me for who I was. Scratch that. I mean, I'm going to work for the federal government. Pretty impressive. But I kept thinking over and over. I'm going to work for the FBI. <laughs> and I couldn't wait to get to Washington, D.C. And that first week was like a dream come true. They took me around, they introduced me to all the special agents. And then after all the introduction was over, they took me downstairs to the firing range where all the agents practiced their target shooting. That was their very first mistake. Their second mistake is when they handed me a Thompson 45 submachine gun. <laughs> I shot up their entire ceiling that day without even trying. It was a long time before they let me go back downstairs. <laughs> and then came the second week. I'll never forget that week. That's the week I started my training to become what was known as a fingerprint examiner for the FBI. Within the first five minutes, I realized I had made the greatest mistake of my life. And someday when you don't have anything else to do, just take a look at any one of your fingers. All those funny lines are fingerprints. It was my job to tell you if it was a circle or a loop or a whirl. And then to tell you exactly where the middle of that fingerprint started. Then eight hours a day, five days a week, it was my job to count every single one of those lines on that finger. And I can honestly tell you, if you've seen one fingerprint, you've seen them all. <laughs> and I began to pray, God, please just get me out of this mess. I can't hack it. When one day my supervisor comes running in, she's all upset, and she tells me to stop everything, that I have to get to the front office right away. The front office. There's only two reasons the person goes to the front office of the FBI. Either to be terminated from their job or to be interrogated by the FBI agent, that's it. I get down to the front office. I walk into the room, there's nine men standing on the walls. Each of them in three-piece suits, they look typical like Jimin. They take one look at me and they tell me to sit down. And then the question started, and they went something like this. Miss Thomas, we understand that you read lips to communicate, and you do a very good job. But there's only one thing we want to know, just one. Do you watch TV? Do I watch TV? That's all you guys want to know? 
I mean, is it a federal crime to watch TV? I confess, I watch TV. Well, is it difficult for you, Miss Thomas? Do you get anything out of it? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, no, I don't. I mean, I don't know, do you know what I mean? You know, if the camera's on the person and I can see the lips, I can read them. But so many times, the camera's not on the person. I don't have any understanding. Well, how about movies, Miss Thomas? Do you go to movies? Is it any better for you? Well, yeah, I do. I mean, I go to movies, and it's a lot better, it really is, you know? The lips, they're a lot bigger. <laughs> on and on went the question, and I came to realize that the FBI had a very large problem. Actually, since then, they're still having their problems. But basically, on this particular day, they were video filming the suspects. But on this particular case, when the camera activated, the sound mechanism failed. They had all this film with the bad guys talking. They just couldn't hear it. And they wanted to know if maybe I would watch it, write down any words that I could get. I said, sure, no problem. From that day on, I never went back to reading fingerprints. <laughs> From that day on, I basically read lips for the FBI. And to sum up my job, I followed the bad guys around and I read their lips. Then I went and told the good guys what the bad guys were saying. And they even paid me to do it too. <laughs> and overnight, like the snap of a finger, I finally made it in that world of sound. Good job, good pay, somewhat of a name in Washington. For three and a half years, I lived in the fast lane of Washington, D.C., celebrating my success. At the end of three and a half years, I came to realize that there had to be an awful lot more to life than the Washington scene. And I began to pray that God would take me to where his word was taught, never realizing that the answer to that prayer would come forth with my resignation from the FBI to head south, to go to seminary. And never in my wildest imagination did I realize the lessons that God would have waiting for me in seminary. You see, what most of you don't realize is even the fact that I read lips to communicate. All of my life, I have struggled with my deafness. It has become my worst enemy where I would grow with bitterness and hatred. So many times I cried out to God, please, just let me hear. And it was always that silence. I had a unique way of taking matters into my own hand. Because you see, all I wanted to do was fit in with people. <laughs> I read lips one on one. No more than three or four people can be a part of my room without me deteriorating. Why is that? Someone will talk, I will watch them. They will stop talking and somebody else will start. By the time I find that person, I've lost a sentence, a word, a paragraph. And for every person that you add into my room, I start deteriorating at an alarmingly rate. Seminary. God brought me face to face with my deafness. And in so doing, God brought me to the foot of the cross. I can honestly say that all those years when I showed up for church on Sunday, when I sang the hymns, when I claimed to be a Christian, it wasn't until I went to seminary that I truly gained my salvation in the Lord. 
because salvation is simply that free gift. We can't earn it, we can't deserve it. We accept it from him, and in order to accept it, we must go to the foot of the cross and humble ourselves and simply say, Father, I can't do it alone. I basically can't do it at all. I turn my life over to you. I give it to you all. It's your job. It's your way. And I will follow. Since that time, gradually but surely, my worst enemy was changed and transformed into my best friend. You see, friends, it's only in the silence that we truly hear that still, small voice of God. And it's only in his voice of his leading and guiding that he will show us the way. And when he does, he will show us things that we can't even possibly comprehend and imagine. The way of the cross is simply one of the most incredible journeys that a person can ever take. Those years would be one in which I would grow and have the understanding of him. But little did I realize that even though I was halfway through my life, my biggest challenge was yet to come. Two years ago, in April, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. I was on my way to Dallas, Texas, to speak before a ladies group of about 10,000. Valentine's Day, February 14th, this one little finger went numb. Through the week, it had crawled up my arm. And by the time I got to Dallas on February 28th, it had gone up the side of my head, and I thought it was going to just keep going and come down the other side. I had no idea what the problem was, but after the MRIs, the spinal taps, and the blood work, it was confirmed without a doubt that my brain stem and that my spinal cord was filled and rank with the disease. As a result, in the past two years, I'm moving a lot slower. Actually, I'm moving real slow. It has affected my right side, or I tell my friends that if I move any slower, I'll be moving backwards. But I'm okay with that because I got it all planned out in my brain that I'll just get one of the fastest motorized chair in the country. <laughs> and as my friends and I walk down the street, I'll just leave them in the dust. They won't be able to keep up with me. <laughs> We're okay with that. But one of the things that I'm still struggling with, it has affected my eyesight big time. After two years, they thought that it might come back and stabilize, but it's still going. And I'm faced with the reality of having my worst nightmare coming to being. As a child living in the world of Simon, I knew that my eyes were everything. And so many times I basically said to God, it's okay, you can have my ears. Just don't take my eyes. And I never could fully comprehend what it would be like without hearing and without seeing. And so I've been having long talks with God about this in the sense that basically I say something in the fact, you know, God, if I don't have my eyes, I won't be able to communicate anymore because I totally read lips. And basically, if I can't read the lips of people, I'm not going to really be able to talk to them. And if I can't talk to them, 
then you got a problem because I'll be talking to you 24 hours a day and it's really going to be a mouthful. <laughs> I'm not exactly sure what he's going to do. But you see, through the years of my silence, the way I struggled and the way I wrestled with God about being deaf, I learned a very important lesson when I came to the cross that no matter what our lot might be dealt with, we have the choice of either wrestling, hating it, despising it, or we have the way to embrace it, to learn by it. Either way we choose, we are still going to have the situation before us. And as a result, I am pleased to say that I have embraced my MS as a part of me, as a part of me walking with the journey. And I have been blessed knowing and understanding the word grace than I could ever possibly imagine. You see, with each and every new day, I don't know how I'm going to be when I wake up. I don't know if I'll really be able to walk with that day or if I'll be able to even read the computer. But through his grace, each day, he lets me know that he's with me. He'll always be there. And we'll see it through. And how did I make it this far? By God's grace and by God's people. You know, I think one of the most second popular questions that I received today is, Thomas, how long did you say you worked for the FBI? Only for three and a half years. Just long enough to get a TV series out of it. <laughs> Who could have found them? Who could have imagined? that the kid that was laughed at and ridiculed and despised for talking so bad, that was such the big dummy in school, would one day work for the FBI. And then further still, to have their own TV series that's being watched by, I think, something like 2.5 million people on the weekly basis and it's now seen in over 15 countries around the world. How did I get to this point? By God's grace and God's grace only. And by the help of his people. Let's go back for just a second. Let's talk about those three lives that were so instrumental. That first mean little old lady, my speech therapist, does she honestly believe that the very first day that she saw me, she thought to herself, wow, if I pour my life into this kid, if I give up my all, I give up my best, I will get her to be a speaker that will be traveling around the world with the voice. Are you kidding me? She saw one of the greatest challenges before. A little kid that had no sound, but it was her job to give me the gift of speech by sight, by touch. Over and over, repetitiously, day in and day out, she did the same thing year after year. And in spite of that, there is still some sounds that I struggle with that I can't do too well. And one of those is the S. And I think that God has a tremendous sense of humor at times. When he had my parents call me Susan, not just with one S, but two S's. As a result, I call myself Thomas Salon. It's my name, it's my last name but I can see it, and I can feel it, and it fits with me. Let's talk about the skating coach. 
Did he honestly believe that he could take the kid that couldn't hear the music and make into a champion? It doesn't matter that he gave me my biggest trophy in life. Forget the trophies. They collect dust, they tarnish. What matters is this one man gave me my self-esteem when the rest of the world was trying to take it from me. Or how about that second mean little old lady in my life? My typing teacher. Does she honestly believe that she could take a dummy and make it into a college grad? Three lives so very, very different from each other, and yet the common denominator is the same. They gave it their all. They never wavered. They never gave up. And probably most importantly, they never, ever saw the final results of their labor. Three lives no different than the lives of studying before me tonight. I don't know who you are, or where you've been, or what you do, but I do know one thing. When God created you, he created you unique, one in a kind, and only you hold the special qualities and the special gifts that you have to offer to the world. When I read my Bible, I look through the pages, and my favorite passages are those dealing with miracles. And one of my favorite miracles is probably the most popular one of the Bible. It's found in the 14th chapter of Matthew. You know, it's that one where Christ feeds the multitude of thousands with the fish and the bread. Let's go back in time for just a brief moment and relive that miracle. We are sitting on the hillside. It's late in the afternoon. It's hot and it's dusty. And we see these thousands of people coming over the hills. We zero in on a small little band of men that's having this discussion. They look a little perplexed. And we see one that's being encouraged by the others to leave the group, and we follow him. And as we watch him, he goes over to Jesus. And he looks to Jesus and says, Master, look at all of these people. They're tired and they're hungry and they don't have anything to eat. Send them away. And we look at Jesus and we see the look of love and compassion on his face. And he looked at his disciples that day and he says, they don't need to go away. And then here's the bomb. They don't need to go away. You feed them. Christ did not say that day, they don't need to go away, I will feed them. He says, you feed them. Well, you can only imagine the look on the disciples' face that day, because face it. They didn't have Kentucky Fried Chicken or Pizza Hut that they could pick up the phone and order for all these people. All they had was a loaf of bread and a smelly fish. And with that, Christ says to his disciple, go gather. And we see the disciple running off into the dust, brings back the loaf to Jesus. And one of the greatest miracles takes place. Christ takes that small loaf, offers it up to the Father for the blessing. Through the blessing, he breaks the loaf, and he gives to the disciples, and they gave to the people, 
and they all ate, and there was even some left over. One of the greatest miracles of all time. Tonight, in this congregation, I can ask the question, how many of you truly know what it's like to be blessed by God? Let's see the hands. You betcha. There is nothing more sweeter, nothing more profound, nothing more overwhelming than the blessings by the hand of God. So much that sometimes we have to say, Father, enough, because we just can't handle anymore. And yet, I'll ask the question and be honest with yourselves. How many of you truly know what it's like to be broken by God? It's the pits. We wouldn't wish it upon anyone. There's nothing more powerful, sometimes more shameful, than the brokenness of the hand of God on us. And yet, do you realize we are two-thirds of the way there for that miracle? He has blessed us. He has broken us. And the only reason for that brokenness is to put us back together the way he wants us to be. Because only then can he use us fully. He has blessed us. He has broken us. And now he wants to offer us up to his people. The question is, will we allow him? Yes. I'm on the platform speaking. Yes. I have a weekly TV series. And it's happened by the grace of God and through his people that have made it happen. Like a grain of wheat that must bear fruit we must die that we may live in Christ. We are winnowed and ground into flour by that divine harvester, kneaded and baked into that small loaf that Christ will bless and will multiply for his people. Then, well, that's the story. And this, well, this is the song. Silent night. lives, and yet there would be a fourth, a fourth that would be so powerful with my transformation that no medical doctor would be able to restore my hearing, that no educator would be able to give me my independence 
through knowledge and wisdom. You see, it's physically impossible for me to travel the world by myself. Because at night when I go into my hotel room and I close the door, you can knock all day, you can knock all night, all week, all month or year, and I will never open that door because I can't hear you. The good Lord knew my needs. And basically, ten and a half years ago, sent me a friend that traveled with me for about 10 years. With that loss, I was thrown back into my world of silence and had long forgotten. Little did I realize that he was already in the mode and the making of sending me that other friend. Tonight, it is an honor and it is a privilege to introduce to you my best friend, my cost of traveling companion, Amazing Grace. Come here, Grace. She is a certified hearing dog for the deaf. She has been trained to alert me to all of my sounds by physical contact. That when somebody knocks on the door, she will find me, jump on me, and lead me to the door. Those sounds will be the door knocker, the doorbell, the oven timer, smoke detector, name calling, telephone ringing, baby crying, all different sounds. She has truly broken my sound barrier for me. And we have been together for seven years. Tonight, she is making her last public appearance with me as she has lymphoma cancer. And basically, the 1st of October, I will be receiving my third hearing dog. That dog has been in training now for a little over a year. And it will be a dual dog that will not only teach me to hear, but it's also being trained for my multiple sclerosis, that it will help me with my balance and to be able to retrieve and to pick things up. Friends, basically this is the frosting of the cake. If the good Lord can create this dog so powerfully to forever change and transform my life, just think how much more he can use you if you allow him. Thank you. You have been a nice, quiet audience this evening. We really appreciate you. May you go forth in his name and serve him with all of your heart. God bless you.